Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Justin Grainert. I'm the Vice President of Public Policy for the Chattanooga Area Chamber of Commerce. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're going to be talking all things OSHA mandates and, and special session updates. So uh, with us today, we have our Public Policy Chairman and uh, Employment Lawyer at Chambliss, uh, Justin Furrow, who is going to yes. talk us through all of the intricacies of, of the, the turbulent two weeks we've had here in, in Tennessee. So, uh, Justin, we finally have an emergency temporary standard. Uh, what's in it and what does it mean for our business members? Well, I'm glad you asked, Justin, and I'm glad we booked off three hours for this presentation. So everybody <laughs> sit down, get a cup of coffee, and let's go. Uh, no, just kidding. Um, so what I want to do, and as, as Justin mentioned, I'm Justin Furrow. I'm the chair of the labor and employment section at Chambliss by day and the vice president of public policy or vice chair of public policy uh, at the chamber by, by night. Um, what I'd like to do is take a high level overview of federal OSHA's ETS. Everybody's heard about it. Everybody's heard it's the, it's the vaccine mandate, but not many people know what's in there. So uh, we'll do a kind of high level and then I think uh, do, do a little bit deeper dive at the end on some of the intricacies. So from a high level standpoint, federal OSHA has issued an emergency temporary standard that is effective for a maximum of six months. It became effective uh, November 5th upon publishing in the Federal Register with an asterisk that we're going to talk about in, in just a little bit, but it came effective on November 5th, and it applies to companies that have 100 or more employees. That's 100 or more employees nationwide. It's full or part-time, both count. Independent contractors don't count. Um, if you have separate entities that are under a common ownership or a similar ownership, if you have kind of a, a, an overarching safety coordinator or safety matters are handled at a higher level, they can be aggregated all together to determine whether that 100 employee uh, threshold is met. But it's literally any of your employees all across the country. So if you're a company that has 20 kiosks across the United States, each of which has five employees, you would have 100 if my math is still correct, and you would be subject to the ETS. There are a few businesses, a few types of businesses that the ETS does not apply to. First of all, it doesn't apply to federal contractors. Federal contractors have their own separate rule. It's by executive order. Uh, they are required to comply with the safer federal workforce task force guidelines on employee vaccination. It doesn't apply to certain healthcare employers that are subject to the healthcare emergency temporary standard that was issued earlier this year. Um, it also doesn't apply to certain kinds of employees. Employees that work exclusively outdoors, employees that work exclusively from home, and essentially employees that, that don't interact with any person throughout the day. So even if they're reporting to a work site, if they don't interact with employees or customers, it doesn't apply to them. But what does it require? Well, it requires a policy, an employment policy that either mandates vaccination or that allows non-vaccinated employees to be tested once a week every week, every seven days before they come to work and requires them to wear a face covering when they're at work. Now you may say, well, how do I know about vaccination status? Well, that's another thing the emergency temporary standard requires is it requires the company to uh, obtain proof of vaccination for all employees. So you have to go ask all your employees whether they're fully vaccinated. In other words, have received two doses in a two dose set, one dose in a one dose set, and, and then post two weeks. Uh, so fully vaccinated, partially vaccinated, they've started the process but haven't fin finished yet, or not vaccinated at all. If the employee is uh, not, uh, it's, refuses to provide proof, they're considered to be not vaccinated at all for purposes of this. If, you, uh, if you're not one of the employers that uh, have a mandatory vaccination policy, if you allow for the testing carve out, a few things you have to do. One, you have to provide up to four hours paid time off for employees to get the vaccine. Uh, two, for employees that test, you may have to pay for that, depending on whether another federal law applies, the Fair Labor Standards Act, or whether you're within a state that has a law that would require you to pay for it. This ETS doesn't, though. The ETS also, the Emergency Temporary Standard, also doesn't require you to pay for the cost of the test. You can have that borne by your employees, uh, or you can, uh, you can bear that yourself if you want to. And I think with the tightening labor market, that's something some companies may decide to do. So fully vaccinated, you're, you're good there. Not fully vaccinated, you have to test once a week. Or if you don't uh, report to the office once every seven days, you have to do it within seven days of reporting. 
You also have to have a negative COVID test if you're a new hire that's not fully vaccinated before you can start. Um, that, Justin, is the basic. I mean, there's a lot of details in there. The face covering, you have to, if you're not fully vaccinated, you have to wear a face covering when you're at work or when you're in a car with somebody else for work purposes. Uh, company doesn't have to pay for that either. Um, the testing obligation for non-vaccinated employees is, is, um, is re re released or is taken away if they have had a positive COVID test. So that's another thing you have to ensure under this policy is that employees report a positive COVID test to you. For those that are non-vaccinated, they report a positive test. They don't have to test for the next 90 days. Whether fully vaccinated, not fully vaccinated, if you get a positive test, you got to come out of work until you can come back into work according to CDC guidance or healthcare provider guidance if they're uh, working with healthcare, healthcare provider. And uh, you don't have to pay for that time off under the ETS. That is a very high level six minute overview of a 490 page emergency temporary standard it was published in the Federal Register on November 5. All of its requirements with the exception of full vaccination or test were set to go into effect within 30 days. So December 5, it was a 60 day run rate for full vaccination before the testing requirement starts. So January 4th, and that's why you saw a lot of the public commentary and uh, a news article saying everyone had to be fully vaccinated by January 4th. That uh, is the basics of the federal OSHA emergency temporary standard, um, which, which is the result of President Biden's announcement on September 9th and instruction to OSHA to issue that. So one of the things that I know we've heard about is, is we've heard a lot about the, uh, the, uh, the backlog in terms of our supply chain. Um, and I know there's been a lot of talk about whether truck drivers are somehow exempt from this. I know Canada looked at finding an exemption for truck drivers. Uh, did they make the cut in that or are they, they did not? Okay. No, not, not expressly exempt. I mean, there's a lot of discussion about whether they're a, an employer that doesn't report to a workplace. But if you read the guidance and the preamble, I, I, I think you're going to have a really hard time carving them out. Now, you may have a situation where a trucker's on the road and is not interacting with others for a more than seven day period. Uh, but at the moment, I think the, the way this is structured, they, they only want the OSHA only wants the exceptions to apply in the rare instance where an employee does not encounter others in performing the work duties. So if you think a trucker, I think we often think of somebody sitting in the cab of a truck driving. We don't think though of the time they have to spend at the depot, the time they spent picking up the trailer, picking up a new truck, changing trucks, uh, going into the office to do paperwork, going into the customer's facility or terminal or whatever the case may be. So I think you're going to be hard pressed to say truckers are categorically exempt. Um, they, they certainly didn't make an express exemption. Okay. So we, we get all that on Friday. And by Saturday, uh, it's in the news that there is a, an injunction from the Fifth Circuit uh, Court of Appeals. That's right. Uh, federal court. Um, what does that mean for this process? So great question. Um, those of you that watch College Game, game Day will sometimes hear Lee Corso say, not so fast, my friend. Uh, <laughs> that's what the Fifth Circuit said to OSHA on Saturday. Not so fast, my friend. So uh, the way this works, if, if, if an industry group or an employer or an individual or anybody for that matter wants to challenge an OSHA rule, which this is an emergency, an OSHA emergency rule, they have to file a petition for review within a circuit court of appeal. So it's bypassing the trial court level and going to the circuit court of appeal. There are 11 numbered circuits plus the DC circuit uh, in, uh, in our federal appeals system. This one in particular was filed in the fifth circuit. There've been, I looked at it earlier today and I couldn't pull it up quickly, but I believe there, uh, there've been filed in the fifth, sixth, eighth, and 11th. I think there's one in the DC circuit I think the anticipation is that there will be, now a, a lot of those are maybe what, what some would consider to be Republican dominated. They have more Republican appointees as judges than Democratic appointees. I think there's some thought that there will start to be um, more of these kind of pro OSHA ETS suits filed in, uh, in some of your more Democratic leaning circuits. But in any event, uh, the, the group that filed in the Fifth Circuit asked the Fifth Circuit to stay enforcement of the ETS, of the mandate, pending judicial review. 
The Fifth Circuit came down finding grave constitutional and statutory concerns on Saturday, so one day later, uh, and put down a stay. Um, they've ordered expedited briefing, the Fifth Circuit has. The government has to respond by five o'clock today. The petitioners then get to reply by Thursday at five o'clock, and then, then the court will maybe further consider whether to a, a further stay, whether to remove the stay. You know, it's really interesting, and I could really nerd out on the legal points because that's what I do for a living. Uh, there's some discussion about whether this could actually function as a nationwide injunction or whether it doesn't. It's not an express nationwide injunction, but I think it kind of operates that way, and I think many are, are, are taking the zone will operate that, that way. And just so the viewers know uh, where it's going to go from here is, remember, you got 5th, 6th, 8th, 11th, D.C. Circuit, maybe some other courts of appeals that are going to have challenges filed. What will happen is within the 10 days after the rules issuance, so 10 days after the 5th, they look at all challenges that have been filed. They go to the multi-district litigation panel and draw a number out of the hat at random for the Circuit Court of Appeal in which all of these challenges will get isolated. So that Circuit Court, even if it's not the Fifth Circuit, can undo the Fifth Circuit stay, can issue its own say, issue its own order. So um, there, are, I think, have been 27 states that have sued. There's a lot of litigation, a lawyer's dream, uh, a lot of litigation out there over it. The Fifth Circuit's may have been the first word, but it certainly won't be the last. What are the odds that this ends up in the Supreme Court and they decide this and, and what would a timeline look like for that if it does get, you know, fast track to the court? I think the odds are very high. I mean, certainly this is going to be an expedited briefing schedule because, I mean, we have we have the pandemic. So let's not lose sight of the fact that we, we are still within a pandemic. I know that numbers are looking good and, and, and all that. But we are still within the pandemic. Um, also, emergency temporary standards are only effective for a maximum of six months. So you have a limited burn rate uh, for the emergency temporary standard to be effective. Uh, even with expedited briefing, though, it's going to take a while because these are weighty decisions. And, and this is not the only case on any of these courts dockets. And the amount of information that's going to be filed, I mean, while briefs are limited to, I think, you know, 25, 50 pages, something like that. The supporting materials are hundreds of thousands. And then the friend of court briefs that will be filed. It's going to be a lot of stuff for any one court to process. I do think it will end up at the Supreme Court at some point because, as we always say, uh, well, let me back up. Another nerd lawyer point. There will be a request for Supreme Court review. The Supreme Court is not an automatic appellate court. You have to request review and they have to grant it. And so, if the Supreme Court declines review, that allows the underlying court decision to remain in effect. It would only be uh, if the Supreme Court granted review. I think everybody will ask for it to happen. Whether the Supreme Court does it is a different story. So while we've said all of that, and there are a lot of moving parts, and it's not uh, it's about as clear as mud at this point, I think, um, is what I would say. Um, we, we live in a state where TOSHA actually rules the roost as opposed to OSHA. That's right. Uh, Talk to us about what that means for Tennessee and how that impacts uh, businesses within our region, um, especially those that may have may have uh, businesses in multiple states. Yeah, great question, Justin. So for my Tennessee friends, our Tennessee employers, this federal OSHA ETS does not apply to you. Period. End of report. Um, <laughs> but it's not that easy. You know, um, so Tennessee, as, as Justin alluded to, is a state plan state, which means it petitioned for and received approval by the federal government, federal OSHA, to run its own occupational safety and health program. One of the conditions or criteria for allowing or for being able to do so is that the state standards, the state protections for workers have to be at least as effective as the federal standards. So what happens in a situation such as this is your state plan states, there are 22 of them uh, around us, think Tennessee, Kentucky, the Carolinas, and Virginia, right? So your state plan states within 30 days are supposed to pass their own emergency temporary standard that is at least as effective as the federal standard. So in theory, the Tennessee government would have 30 days from this past Friday to enact its own emergency temporary standard that mandating vaccines or masks or what, you know, whatever, uh, whatever it can demonstrate it believes is at least as effective. The Tennessee government has sued uh, to, to have the mandate, the ETS declared invalid. 
I don't think Tosha is going to be jumping through hoops right now to try to take uh, quick and swift action to enact its own emergency temporary standard. As of right now, though, this ETS only applies in, in states where Fed OSHA has jurisdiction. So let's take an easy example for us Chattanoogans who are right close to the border. Let's say I'm a company headquartered in Dalton that has 75 employees in Dalton and 50 employees in Chattanooga. So I have a total of 125, but I don't have 100 down in uh, Georgia. And, you know, Tennessee hasn't enacted anything yet. Well, this ETS still applies to me because the 100 employee threshold is determined number of employees corporate wide nationwide. Uh, but the mandate only applies where Fed OSHA has jurisdiction. Fed OSHA has jurisdiction in Georgia. So for those 75 down in Dalton, assuming this comes into effect, and, and again, there's only been one ETS. I think I, I've, heard, I've seen conflicting numbers and haven't run this to ground, but before this summer, there had been nine or 10 that had been passed emergency temporary standards. Of the six or seven that had been challenged, only one survived. So as one, as one uh, brief writer put it, the Fed OSHA has a pretty low batting average in emergency temporary standards. Uh, but if this were to go into effect, then it would only apply to the Georgia employees in my hypothetical, not the Tennessee employees. That's very helpful. Thank you for clarifying that. That was one of the, uh, that's one of the questions that I've gotten a lot from, from our members. So, uh, thank you for providing, providing that clarity. Um, and, and if, if things couldn't even couldn't get even more complicated, um, the state had a special session. Uh, I believe it was was going on two weeks ago. Um, that wrapped up started uh, Wednesday and ended at uh, two thirty five a.m. on Saturday morning. Um, that, that sort of threw some more wrinkles into all of this for uh, Tennessee businesses. Um, right. Senate Bill nine nine zero one four and House Bill nine zero seven seven. Um, the House and Senate both passed um, competing bills, but uh, at the end of the day, went to conference committee. Um, and what the bill does at a high level, it prevents businesses from actively requesting uh, vaccination cards. Um, it also allows for mask mandates, but causes them to be uniform across the entire company. So there can't just be unvaccinated folks that have to wear masks. Um, and, and more and more cause of alarm, I think, for the business community in Tennessee is it creates a cause of action for employees against their employer um, when it comes to, to, to COVID vaccine specific um, checks. Um, and it also provides unemployment insurance for those that, that leave their job um, due to um, not wanting to take the vaccine. So how does that all play into um, the OSHA piece. Obviously, it, it, it as a state law, um, did not put a number of employees on the business. So mm -hmm. it affects everybody. Yep. But specific to those 100 plus employee entities, how does this play out? Well, I think many are going to feel like they're in a position of uncertainty and stuck between the proverbial selling charybdis rock and the hard place, right? Um, in reality, I think what you're going to see is if there is a Fed OSHA rule, a Fed OSHA standard, a federal law, it should preempt any state law to the contrary. What's going to be really unique in Tennessee is that Fed OSHA standard does not apply in Tennessee. So it's going to be dependent upon the Tennessee Occupational Safety and Health Administration to enact its own standard and how they deal with that, um, given kind of the challenges is, is going to make for a unique situation. I think what a lot of people don't recognize, you know, I think many people might, if they're, if they're anti-governmental mandate, might tell TOSHA just to say, thumb your nose at the federal government and don't pass that standard. Unfortunately, though, what happens then is if federal OSHA decides that Tennessee standards aren't at least as effective as the federal standards, they can go ahead and take steps to revoke our state plan status and have Fed OSHA come in and take control over occupational uh, safety and health matters in the state of Tennessee, which is something that, that, that none of us really want. And so I, th I think it's gonna create for some uncertainty, particularly until we see how TOSHA is gonna handle this interesting uh, position that it finds itself in. So TOSHA has a, so to clarify, TOSHA has 30 days from last Friday mm -hmm. to come up with a plan. That would put them on course, though, to be 30 days after 
everybody else, correct? That's correct ish. And I say ish. ish because, you know, if you look at the healthcare emergency temporary standard that came out federally June 10th, uh, TOSHA standard came out kind of mid August. So it was more 60 days. Really, the, the state plan states are supposed to notify Fed OSHA what they're doing within 15 days. I think if Fed OSHA then sees that they're making progress or they're working toward something that might be workable, they give a little more leeway. They don't put that hammer down. Right. Uh, recognizing that it, it takes time to do this, particularly if you're not going to just pass word for word the federal standard, if you're going to try to really target what, what you believe is impactful for Tennessee employers, it takes time to do this. Um, so, yeah, 30 ish days, give or take. OK, so that would put that would put it basically it's essentially 60 and 90 for Tennessee companies, correct? Ish. Yeah. Ish. OK. Um, I guess I, one of the last things I think I want to cover here is just where does this all end? Like, I mean, obviously, um, you know, you have six months uh, for the emergency temporary standard. A lot of the stipulations in the House bill and the Senate bill, you know, run out in 2023, essentially. Um, and there were a couple of specific carve outs I do want to note for our members um, on the vaccine front. Um, it did create a carve out for the healthcare industry. So those healthcare entities are allowed to um, have a vaccine mandate and require it. Um, they do have to um, get permission from the comptroller of the state's office to be preempted from the state law. Uh, and those with federal contracts um, that are under the executive order, um, which I know contracts have already gone out that require full vaccination with documentation, uh, are exempt as well through the same process. They have to, the, the comptroller of state will come up with a process in which those businesses can, can, can opt out of the state law um, because of the contract with the federal government. So those were two concessions that, that the business community did help get um, in this process. But at the end of the day, where does this all end for our business community? And, um, you know, put your, put your crystal ball hat on. I know that's probably not the smartest question to ask a lawyer, but um, where do you see this all going? Well, Justin, when you ask a lawyer to put the crystal ball hat on, they're probably best they're going to tell you is it depends. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of work, lawyers are working really hard right now in the litigation process. A lot of legislatures were working really hard in the legislative process. I'm not sure where it ultimately ends. I think there's going to be a period of uncertainty over the next, call it 60-ish days, while we try to hash out federally what's happening. Uh, I would not be surprised if the ETS were declared invalid. Uh, I wouldn't, would not be surprised if at some point it were, it were withdrawn. Um, you could very, you know, lest there be a defeat in court, you could very easily see the government at some point uh, saying, well, we believe we've gotten enough percentage of vaccinations. We don't need the ETS. Uh, there's no longer any grave danger. I think Tennessee, particularly Tennessee and TOSHA, will only be dragged kicking and screaming into an emergency temporary standard that is similar to this. And I think um, I think there will be a, a long fight at that front to try to preserve state plan status, but not have to enact this on uh, Tennessee citizens. So I think right now the new normal is going to be a period of uncertainty. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of a, a lot happen between now and the end of the year that might further flesh out where we're going to be with vaccine mandates. Well, what I will what I will tell our membership, obviously, is we're staying on top of this um, quite closely, and um, this will not be the last one of these we do as things sort of continue to unfold. Um, we will continue to to host forums like this, as well as um, uh, different webinars and, and, and content, so that you can make the best decisions um, that you can um, in these kind of uncertain times. Uh, Justin, is there anything else uh, that you think is important to cover or, or to leave our, our viewership here with before we, we call this one a day? No, I mean, I think we've hit the high points very, very well. I mean, what I would encourage our membership is, um, you know, the media does a good job of, of reporting, but, but they're not lawyers and they're not public policy folks. And so they don't always know the nitty gritty details of the bills. And so I would give a hat tip to Justin's public policy updates. They're, they're very good. Uh, at summarizing kind of the happenings. Um, 
So stay tuned for Justin's uh, updates and pay attention to them and pay attention to these videos because we're doing our best to put this out um, as it goes. But it, there's a lot of stuff to digest and you need to kind of keep your fingers to the pulse of, of your, you know, your local chamber constituency or whoever your person is to kind of understand where we are in the world on any given day. Awesome. Well, Justin, thank you for your time today. Again, this will not be the last time we do this, I'm sure. Uh, the Justin and Justin show has been quite successful throughout this, this right. run. And hopefully um, you as our chamber members uh, get value out of this. We want to be um, one of your trusted resources as, as these things kind of move quickly um, so we can get you the best information possible. So Justin, thank you for your time today. Um, we will do this again. And he mentioned the public policy updates. If you are interested and don't receive them already, you can shoot me an email at jgrainert at chattanoogachamber.com and I'll get you on that list. It comes out four days a week, most weeks. And uh, we try to do our best to give you uh, business, uh, business important information, uh, kind of cuts through a lot of the noise and, and a lot of this kind of information um, is stored in those. So if you are interested and don't get them yet, please let me know. Um, we're happy to get you added. Justin, um, thank you. And, and until next time, uh, when we do this again, uh, we'll sign off for now. Yeah. Thank you, Justin. Appreciate it.